Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Interhouse Drama Monologue Mania Competition, an initiative by the students for the students. As part of the Dramatic Art Syllabus, the Grade 11 drama learners have put in a tremendous amount of effort as directors. The collaborative process involved choosing themes, creating audition posters, marketing the event, organizing audition schedules, selecting the best candidates, coaching, directing, and even writing some of the monologues you will see tonight. This endeavor is an invaluable experience, as many of the skills required to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution are cultivated and honed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome our esteemed adjudicators, Mr. Dareth Crawford, Mr. Scott Enslin, and Mr. Terence Bridget. Without further ado, please sit back and enjoy the show. Have you ever been on top of the world? Your life was amazing. You had an amazing boyfriend or girlfriend. You were acing all of your classes. You were on good terms with all of your friends. And you just got onto that amazing sports team. But then all of a sudden your beloved breaks up with you. You're getting C's. Your friends all hate you and you just got kicked off of that amazing sports team that you worked so hard to get on. You probably wonder why. Well, I can tell you with absolute certainty that you deserved it. How can I say such a thing? It's because I made it happen. I am Nexus. My official name is the Goddess of Retribution. You may know me as the Goddess of Revenge, but I prefer the Goddess of Righteous Anger. One day, I am sitting on Olympus, just listening to Apollo play his lyre, when I hear a very familiar voice. It takes me a second to realize it's my best friend, Echo. Apparently, there was this really handsome young man who was walking through the forest, and she fell head over heels for him. However, he wanted nothing but to have her gone. Her voice sounded so sad. So naturally, I had to intervene. But since this was my best friend, I couldn't do any old revenge. No, I had to become creative. So I ran down to earth, and I made him, Narcissus was, I, was his name, I believe, fall in love with himself. <laughs> you should have seen his face. Although, I didn't mean for him to fall completely in love with himself, and I didn't mean for him to die. I have an unfortunate occupation, but I'm not heartless. So, I left a pretty little flower in his place named Narcissus after the man. I really do love my job. But, see this as a little warning, mortals. If you ever get on my bad side, then I might come knocking on your door next. the boy wants. Well, at least I try. You see, I don't know if it counts if they don't kiss you back. But I try to kiss the boy and it almost worked. You see, we don't go to town very often because grandma isn't too fond of those mortals. Ugh. Plus, there's not much to do or look at there anyway, so. But on Earth, there's a boy named Hercules. He's the hero of that planet. 
Oh, he does it just right and always saves those mortals. And he's got red hair and green eyes and freckles all over his face. And Hercules is so nice. He always says, Thanks. And no problem. I'm strong. And if he says, Have a nice day. You do. That's how damn good he is. And I've always, I've always wanted to be close. To Hercules and talk to him without ram ram. But one day, when Grandma got sick, I got to go to the store all by myself. Oh, I just got some cheese and grapes and then I watched Hercules, watched him do his strong. Boy, it's job. <laughs> oh, and I just stared and stared and stared, counting all those handsome freckles. And then he asked me if there was anything else I wanted. And I just whispered, yes! And then I grabbed him by the ears and I went, And that was my first kiss. My, my only kiss. But it was the most romantic moment of my life. Until um, Zeus uh, pulled me off of him. Why doesn't he come? This waiting is horrible. He should be here by now. To wake my passionate words some fire within me. I'm cold. Cold is a loveless thing. Zeus must have read my letter by now. If he cared for me, he would have come after me. He would have taken me by force. But he doesn't care. He's entrammeled by that woman, fascinated by her, dominated by her. If a woman wants to keep a man, she merely has to appeal to what is worse than him. We make gods of men, and they leave us. We make brutes of others, and they're faithful, and they fawn. How horrible life is. It was horribly mad of me to come here. Horribly mad. And yet, which is worse, to be at the mercy of a man who loves one, or to be the wife of one who dishonors one in one's own home? And what woman knows? What woman in the whole world? But will he love me always? This man who I owe my life? What do I give him? Lips that have lost the note of love, eyes that are blinded by tears, icy heart and chilled hands. I bring him nothing. Then looking at him darkly, he who gathers the clouds spoke to me. Don't sit here and whine, Ares, you double-faced liar. To me, you're the worst god to ever hold up Olympus. Quarreling in your heart is dear to wars and battles and... Do you think I'm being a drama queen? No, actually. That's the exact words my father said to me, thunder and all. And he says I have anger issues. Then why am I here, Doctor? Answer me that. Okay, okay, so I killed all those people. But they were cheesing me off. I mean, calling me daddy's boy and sissy pants. 
Oh, it's hard being the middle child. My mommy never loved me. And there is that whole issue of Hera being my mother and my aunt. Well, yes, it's confusing. What am I supposed to call her? Mommy, auntie? Has my father no scruples? Didn't I fall in love with my sister Aphrodite? Well, yes, but it's a genetic thing, you know, runs in the family, forget what I'm trying to say. But the real issue, oh, it's Athena, now she gets my blood boiling, always outsmarting me in wars, and her armor is more expensive than mine. I mean, I got the hand downs. Oh, I'm sick of it. Do you think I need an urban oil rescue? Well, if you think it would help, Doctor, I'm just, you know, actually quite a lovable guy. I didn't mean to kill Adonis, he was just, oh, so naive, I mean. He couldn't see it was me, dressed up as a ball. What an idiot. Uh, that guy was all looks, no brain. <laughs> he deserved to die, in my opinion, I mean. See, all my deaths have just reasons. But I'm just, I'm just a boy standing in front of his father, asking him to love me. No, I didn't take that from a movie. It's from the depths of my heart instead. But I've made up my mind. I'm joining forces with Atlas and I'm overthrowing that old thunder thighs. There's only one thing left to be done. You won't say anything? You'll keep your mouth shut? Oh, shame. Can't trust you now, Doctor. Send me the bull from Hades. Ares was a monster of man. Self-proclaimed, the king built his throne on his children's sorrows. And there were many. Seems like we were always crying back then, always wishing that our father had left us like all our friends' fathers did. Then maybe we wouldn't have all these scars, all these whoops and bruises. My father was a big, thin, nostril kind of man. Told me everything I know from how to ride a bike to how to keep myself warm with my own anger. He taught us anger and made us figure out love on our own. He kept us locked up like China dolls. The sun burned our eyes when we finally broke free. Seeds planted in darkness never grown quite right. And I'm a wilted flower with social anxiety and notebooks filled with conversations I never had. I blame my dad. Hera told us, pray for him. Ask Zeus to look on his heart and change him. By five, I stopped believing people could change. By ten, I stopped believing in God altogether. My father beat the poet out of me. I built my entire story around hating him. After the stroke, when my monster of a man laid weak and docile, tears streaming down his face. In 18 years, I'd never seen him cry. I didn't feel bad for him. He was the causer of tears. He hobbled around the house, scattered brain, calling his daughters by his sister's names. The hand he used to hit us with. Yana. His 
last words to me were, Jasmine, you know I'm proud of you, right? I didn't. And by that time we'd grown too far apart for me to care about his opinion. I felt nothing. And his pride, my father, died. Who told you you could leave me? I still had things to write about. There was the part where I proved you wrong and finally cussed you out and didn't let you see your grandkids. You weren't supposed to go yet. You always wanted to talk, now say something. Teach me how to mourn you through all this anger. You've been gone for months, but I've been festering in it for years. But now who am I supposed to be without my enemy? You're not going to believe the advice I'm about to give you, but I'd be a lot more careful how much time you're spending looking in mirrors. And no, I'm not saying you look like a weird looking toad or anything. No, <laughs> no, no. Around last week, I got up, I started doing my morning routine and you know the usual, doing some morning affirmations, watching my face, preparing myself to be a <laughs> baddie. And then I look up and you know what I see? My reflection moving. I start freaking out. I'm thinking, why is it moving? I'm not moving. Why is it moving? I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Why is it moving? And then it grabs me and it pulls me inside of the mirror. And it, it's actually nothing how you think it would look like. It's this big white room. And the more I walk around, you know what I notice? My reflection isn't there, meaning she has to be evil. Meaning when she brought me in, she swapped out into the real world. Only a demon would have the audacity to pour stuff like this this early in the morning. I start banging to get out of this mirror. I'm like, get me out of here, I'm stuck in the mirror! And no one comes, so I give up. And all I can think then is, will I even get out of this mirror? And if you're going to trap me in a parallel universe, at least let me bring a friend. Well, never mind that, let me bring my phone. It looked like they had put Pokemon there. <sighs> and that's not even the worst of it. I find out what she's doing while I'm in this mirror. <sighs> okay, so it's the usual stuff, you know. She's talking to people, she's at my school, talking to the guy I like, telling him I like him, getting rejected. <laughs> and she doesn't even make my bed. When she gets out the mirror, the first thing that she does is just waltz to school. Pajamas, eye bags, all. When I get out my mirror, I get clapped for that. Oh, that reminds me. So then my mom walks in, and I start banging to get out, you know, GET ME OUT OF THIS MIRROR! And she, lo and behold, gets me out the mirror. Barely, she touches the surface. She barely touches the surface, but she pulls me out. And I'm relieved. No, actually no, I was hysterical. Crying, laughing, showing emotion in front of my mother. But I was relieved when the demon came back because then we trapped her back inside the mirror. You know, normal demonic stuff, banging to get out, throwing her in some abandoned yard. And to the demon, if you're watching this right now, please send a more productive version of me next time. Or you don't even have to be productive, just do my Afrikaans speech. <sighs> Family. There's something else, am I right? Okay, like my mom. So the other day she says to me, Erin, we have a guest so bad, you better have your room clean and bath. In my head, I'm like, since when is the dining room table in my room? It's not even on the same story as my room. I 
I swear. My mom must think that the guests have superpowers or something. You know, like they're going to walk into the house, take the biggest sniff of the world, and start gagging. Then, between gags, they're gonna start screaming, Oh my god, there's a sock on the floor, and the bed isn't made, I can sense it. And I don't know why, I don't know when, but somewhere, there's an empty bottle of water on the floor. I just can't handle it. Someone is going to have to break it to the slender man that he's less scary than an empty bottle of water from Typo. I always say, but my mom always does this, even when my friends come over. It's not like they haven't seen my room on FaceTime or on Call of Duty. Uh, but I always say to my mom, no one cares, it's not a big deal. She says, it's a big deal to me. They're gonna think you're a pig and that reflects badly on me. My mom thinks my entire social life hangs on a thread of whether my clothes are in the cupboard or on a chair next to the cupboard. I can tell you right now, those clothes my friends are wearing haven't seen an ounce of water or soap in about a month. But, you know, I have to hand it to my mom. She's not racist or sexist or homophobic or anything like that. She doesn't care where you live or what you wear. But, as long as you don't leave the dishes on the table. Okay, like this one time. I got back from school, and full disclosure, there were a bunch of dirty dishes on the table already. So I go, grab a cup, and I accidentally left it on the table. Only five minutes later, my mom starts shouting, Erin, get down here! So I rush down. Why is your cup on the table? Put it in the dishwasher right now! So I go, and I take my cup, and put it in the dishwasher. starts yelling, so I just block it out. All I hear is, whoa, 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 not your servant, whoa, 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 do everything for myself, whoa, 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 So, I end up doing all the dishes. Not fun. Yes, mom? No, not yet. No, man, it's her turn to do it. I used to believe that I could understand girls. Always knew what they were saying. Always knew what they meant. But that was a long, long time ago. I've soon come to realize that girls are impossible. And no matter how hard I try to understand the secrets of the female mind, it will forever be a mystery. At first, I thought they wanted romance, chivalry, you know, the chocolate, the boombox outside the window, even a love letter. So that's what I did. I put chocolate and a love letter in Tracy's locker every single day without fail. What's not romantic about that? I even threw rocks at a window at night, like they do in the movies. But Instead of kisses, I got a restraining order. And my parents received a ball for her broken window. Looking back at it, I probably should have introduced myself before doing all those things. After Tracy, I fell madly in love with Kate. And I was determined to do it right this time. So, since my first approach was a failure, I took to the internet. And this time, they were saying simplicity and lightheartedness is key. And I shouldn't be too much of a gentleman because men and women are equal. And simping is unattractive and will lead you to getting plain. So I asked Kate on the date. I was about to go pick her up. Then I remembered the rules. So I told her to meet me there. I made sure not to bring flowers. And when it was time to pay for the food, I let her take care of the book. 
on our way, on our way home. I almost slipped. When I saw shivering and shaking, instead of giving her my jacket, I said, you sure look cold. I'm sure glad I brought my jacket. Because you know, woman love a girl with a bit of sense of humor. And I thought the date went amazing. But she blocked me afterwards. I just, I just don't know what to do anymore. One minute, they want one thing. The next, their mind just changes. <sighs> right now, I have this thing for time. It's pretty simple. She's into, what is it again? Um, Spirituality, and I've been listening to, is it Siza? Sa Sa Siza and Lana, Lana Ray Day. Siza and Lana, Lana Ray Day. I even bought crystals and incest. She thought I was cute, but after a week, after a week, she said she couldn't date me because I'm a Gemini moon. I don't even know what that is. I just, I just don't know what to do anymore. I'm just gonna give up. But you know, one thing they say never fails is a Birkin bag. But the only problem is I'm 16 and I'm unemployed. This is an impossible game to win at. I remember the day before quarantine, when we all thought it was a joke. We all thought it was some desperate plot created by pharmaceutical companies in order to create panic and suck the money out of everyone. You know, I did think Michaela was going to get back this calculator I borrowed from her the next day. And things with me and my crush were finally heading somewhere. After all, that was the first time he's ever made eye contact with me. I remember the day it all started. Despite my devastation of not seeing the absolute babe that is Jacob Smith, I was pretty happy. I mean, online school. No teachers nagging you about not doing your homework. Going to school in your pajamas. And the best one, muting the teacher when she tells you what you can and can't do in your own house. A legit dream. I did think it was only gonna be a couple of days though. You know, like a drill. And then everything would go back to normal. Well, I hate to say, but this is not a drill. I've also discovered the stages to complete craziness. I crave going outside for a walk or just something, anything. The stages go like this. Sit and stare at a wall. Eat and get bigger. And binge watch your favorite shows on Netflix. I have been binging some video games myself. And that's when I realized that a game of Among Us is like this pandemic. COVID-19 is the imposter and the spaceships are the quarantining areas. It makes sense, doesn't it? You know, I've even started playing with my siblings and their dumb toys. I need to see my friends. I can't be stuck in this house any longer. Even Woody's is a trip now. All right, girls, off to bed. There's school tomorrow. Lights off. Okay, fine. I'll tell you guys one bedtime story. And it's a funny one, I promise. So, there were three girls, just like all of you. Jenny, who was obsessed with being a Visco girl. Amanda, who would not stop making TikToks, and lastly Skylar, who would never leave a room besides for food. 
the three girls wanted to go on an adventure. So they decided to go to this old abandoned treehouse a few k's away from their home. Amanda asked Skylar if she could drive them there, but she responded with, Chow, don't you remember when I was taking that driver's test? I totes rammed that pavement. I'm such an asparagus. <laughs> you know, now that I say it out loud, maybe that's why I didn't get my license. <laughs> you know, because your mum is... Are you guys even listening? Jeez, jeez, okay, okay, I'll go quicker. So the three girls decide to start walking. They found an amazing spot where Amanda starts to pop off for the gram. Her sisters were the ultimate hype woman. She gave them a little bit of this, a tad of this, and just a hint of this. So after that, they carried on. They found an amazing hammock that Skylar really wants to take a nap on. But her sisters were being salty and insisted, they ain't got time. So they walked on and they found the abandoned treehouse. So Jenny forced her sisters to do the renegade. I am not doing the renegade, it's your bedtime for her TikTok. But little did they know, they were in a hectic treehouse that could not stand children doing TikToks. They were suddenly shrunk and placed in Amanda's pop socket forever. They probably got cancelled for ghosting everyone. Lol. Okay, I've spilled the tea. Off to bed, for real. Just stay calm. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Here she comes. Hi. I'm Sarah Wilson. But of course you knew that already. It's so nice to finally meet you, Mrs. Abbott. Mother. Sorry, I'm not too sure what to call you. Um. What would you like me to call you? Uh, Alright, <laughs> Mrs. Abbott it is. Thank you so much for coming. Is that your car? Wow, it's gorgeous. Oh, sorry, uh, anyway, I, I invited you here because I wanted to ask a few questions about my medical history. You see, last year I got really sick and I wanted to know if anyone in my family is allergic to penicillin. Oh, just me? Alright. Um, I also, I'm planning on going to university next year and I was wondering if maybe you could um, <clears throat> give me some advice or maybe um, help me out. No, 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 I, I promise, I'm not trying to steal your money. It's just there's so many expenses and I'm trying to get a scholarship, but the application fees and everything. No, 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 wait. Stop, please, don't leave. I promise, I'm not trying to steal anything. I just don't understand. You're my mother. I'm your daughter. Who you put in foster care for God knows what. Do you have any idea what my life's been like? All those stories you hear about foster care? Guess what? They're true. One of my foster mothers used to beat us. But I survived. I survived, mother. Just asking for a little bit of help. You are my mother. Didn't you want me? A mistake. a mistake. A, a mistake you kept for four years. Who keeps someone for four years if you're just going to give me away again? No. 
don't worry. I won't call again. But I am not a mistake. My mistake was meeting you. Goodbye, Mrs. Abbott. You know, it's not easy being an ugly stepsister. Everyone's always worried about poor little Cinderella. But what about me? Does my fairy godmother ever worry about me? Never! Nobody ever turns pumpkins into coaches for what? That woman is weird. She's not normal, you know. She's got naturally curly hair. And where's a size four and a half shoe? She's so good natured that it's downright sickening. Would you go around singing to the birds all day? Of course not. <laughs> People think I'm jealous of her. I survived 700 calories for three whole weeks before the ball. I got a perm, a facial, and a manicure doll. I even got a designer gun. Mate, channel dress. I was ready. Princey, here I come. What happens? Cindy, little Cindy, who's never seen an inside of a health bar in her life and doesn't even know the difference between a carrot stick and a chocolatey cake, whoops together a dress from some curtains from pen store, waltzes off to the ball, and snags a prince. It isn't fair. Why does the stepsister always get everything? It really isn't fair. Max? Max, hi, it's Brenda. Listen, I can't come into work today. Um, what? Wait, wait, just let me explain. It's my daughter. She's, um, sick. What do you mean? Well, I have to care for her. Look, I know I've been on the nice Max, but this is something I can't control. I can't get a babysitter. My mother's in the hospital. There's literally no one I could call. Nothing you can do for me. Come on, Max. With my mother in the hospital, I'm going through a divorce. My daughter is ill. What would you have me do? I am committed to this company. I am a great worker. I've been working for you for over 10 years. Look, I didn't plan on my mother being hospitalized. I didn't plan on going through this wonderful divorce and I certainly didn't plan on having a boss who is cold-hearted, bitter and can't understand the needs of human beings. Look, I know about the big presentation today. Don't you think I know that? I've worked on it for months now. But I can't leave my daughter. I'm sorry. What? Max? That happened seven years ago. It was one night, and you know it meant nothing. Don't you dare blackmail me. Look, times are tough right now, okay? Just let me take care of my daughter today. I will make arrangements for her as long as I know my baby is okay. 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 I'll meet you at the hotel on Friday night. Just let me take care of my family today. Hey mom, hey dad. I'm gonna tell you both myself. I was put upon to like thousands of pieces just two days ago. Bloods and guts sprayed everywhere. Some of the guys and I decided to get drunk off base. And when we got back, we started tossing each other with grenades and started daring each other to do some crazy things. So me 
in the craziest of them all, I took the grenade, jammed it right up here in my mouth, and I blew my teeth off, huh? Ah, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. You should have seen their faces. Similar to yours right now. And it was wild, totally stunned. Everyone was totally stunned. Ah. Anywho, I just wanted you guys to hear it from your most perfect freaking son. Because I am absolutely the perfect son. So perfect that you guys just had to send me to war. And you know what the worst part is? You used to tell me that I was like the wind, blowing in no direction, needing to be stopped. But weren't you just like that when you were young, huh? You, you guys chose a path for me just like your parents did for you too. Ah, <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> Just don't punch your channels. <laughs> uh, uh, the chicken smells really good, Ma. You know what? I'm gonna go unpack. Love you guys to bits. <laughs> Right, Charles. I ate all of yours papers. Had them with ketchup. It tasted surprisingly good. <laughs> okay, fine. You probably want me to take our divorce seriously, huh? But here's the thing. You've always called our marriage a joke. So let's use our logic here real quickly, shall we? If A, we never had a serious marriage. Then B, we can't have a serious divorce either. No, we can't. This whole thing, it's a farce. A farce that tastes good with ketchup. <laughs> now, wasn't there last week when your father asked you why you decided to walk down the aisle with me? And you said, <laughs> this is what you said, for the exercise. <laughs> You're a funny man, Charles. See, I'm laughing. I'm laughing because you are about to lose a woman who's infinitely lovely. Take Paul, for example. You know, he's been in love with me since the eighth grade. Sure, he may be a little crazy, but I value his feelings for me. I would never ask him to sign his name to some piece of paper Telling him to switch his feelings of me off forever. That's what you're asking me to do. To sign away my right to everything that we built together. Everything that we are together. I won't do it. I can't do it. Charles, if you want me to be a better wife, I will. Okay, I'll clean better. I'll dress better. Hell, I'll even write you one of my own sonnets. Got one for you right now. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Your eyes as brown as the autumn leaves and your smile. Why aren't you laughing? No, no, Charles, it's all a joke to you, ain't it? Mm -hmm. I keep waiting for you to say April Fools. Of course you won't, though. It ain't even April. You want the truth, Charles? I'll give you the truth. I ate our divorce papers. I ate them because I can't stomach the thought of losing you. said I was stupid when I was a child. Stupid and slow. They used to say, don't let Greta do it. Greta would take all day and sometimes Greta never seems to take in anything you say to her. Didn't they see, all of them, that that made me more stupid and slower? And then, you know, the pandemic hit and I found a way. With all that alone time, 
came up with a plan. I used to pretend to be stupider than I actually was. I spent hours and hours alone in my room. I propped my dolls up on my dresser and I stared as though I didn't understand. But often I, I laughed because I knew more than I thought. tending to people dying like flies, instead of his wife, he got impatient. And I wondered if I could do anything right. But then I'd remember how clever he was, and how good. Only, after all, once that they could tell which revolver a bullet had been fired from. So, I took a second revolver from Henry study and I shot John with that and dropped the other by him. Then I ran around the house, in through the front door, in through that door and over to John. And I picked up the revolver. I thought, you see, at first they'd think I had done it. But then they'd find that it wasn't the right revolver, and I'd be clear. But then I was meant to put the revolver I had shot John with into the film woman's house. But she had left her bag. So it was easier still. I dropped it into that later on in the day. But then when, when I realised that they hadn't arrested her as all the police and detectives were, dead. <laughs> I had to kill her off myself. It was because of her I had to kill John. And now, now I'm alone again <laughs> with the company of my dolls. <laughs> Imagine how much more clever I'll be now. Baby, there's a price to pay. I'm a genie in a bottle. You gotta help me the right. <laughs> you gave me a fright, officer. How long has officer been watching? I'm sorry, I'm not used to all the people after the pandemic, but let me tell you, isolation has been good for my dream of becoming a superstar. watching. So, did you like what you heard? Then why don't you show it? That's not enough. You must clap your hands and stomp your feet and shout and scream, Veronica, Veronica! Then I come out again, you see, and sing some more. That's the way they're going to do it one day. When all the societies that have survived the pandemic come together in Johannesburg and Durban and Cape Town. Veronica! Veronica! We want to hear Veronica! I said to him, he wants the famous Veronica to sing for him, just like that. It will cost you a lot of money, master. For one ticket, 25 rand. And if you bring a girlfriend, you'll have to pay 50 rand. You laugh now, but wait and see. One day it'll happen. I'll be on TV, yeah. Then you can stand here on the stoop and lure to the window and watch me singing. I'll be wearing a beautiful shiny green dress and green shoes with high high heels and long gloves that go all the way up to my elbow and a fancy hairstyle with sparkles in it. You wait and see, my boy. You wait and see. The use of a little dream. A dream must be something big and special. 
It must be the most special thing you can imagine for yourself in the whole world. Don't you have dreams like that? There you see, you've got to dream big. It's like my friend, Alfred the Boy. I, the pandemic took him, but I still talk to him sometimes. He told me he's dreaming about getting a new bicycle. So straight away, I saw this big, black, shiny new bicycle with a loud ring and bell and all that. But he said, no, he just wants to buy a second secondhand bicycle. I was so cross with him. No, Alfred, I said, you're not dreaming properly. It must be a brand new bike with a bell and a bump and a red light at the back. All it! Alfred's a bomb brook. If he dreams properly, he'll get it. He must see it and believe it. Alfred must see that bicycle like he's watching it on TV. Then he must imagine himself sitting on it and ringing the bell and riding around the village and waving at everybody. Then he must believe that is what is going to happen. He must believe that as hard as he can. Because officer, all we have to do is believe. Just imagine when all the societies that have survived the pandemic come together. I have such a big audience. And then officer, then we won't be so lonesome anymore. to your old man jazz music. I really like the way you look at me. How you take off your glasses because your eyes, they, they make me feel warm and <laughs> safe. Like we're sitting by a fire pit with a blanket around us. Maybe drinking hot chocolate. But Dan, I really like the way you make me feel. I'm always happy when I'm with you. My stomach's nervous when I'm around you. But, you see, I think that that's a problem because I haven't felt this way towards anyone before. I want to be your number one the hand, your sanitizer. I want you to want to be with me and only me. I'd wake up and it'd be gray outside. It had been gray for months now, it had been raining. In another life, I might have loved the rain. 
But in this one, I was pulled down by anxieties and fears that now, in our shuttered world, peck at my brain and my stomach. It created tension that lived like a great hulking creature whose claws dug deep into my neck and shoulders. I'd wake up to the sound of rain. I'd try in vain to stretch, only to meet walls upon walls. I couldn't do it. It wore me down and defeated me in ways that steered the ship in a storm. Never will. But those walls that I push up against exhausted me and frustrated me and throw me into anxiety and depression in ways that I was not prepared to ever. I'd wake up to the sound of birds. <laughs> Sky still angry, the clouds still gray, but the wet, dark, vibrant blues that worked through it. There was a cacophony of music right outside my bedroom window. The birds, they, they did not know how the world had stopped, but something had happened outside. The world had stretched, changed, disassembling itself. The grayscale pixels blur and reassert in real time. It was then that, under my feet, I felt it. It was a damn earth filled with warm promise when just a couple months ago, it was dark and frozen. My body yearns to stretch, to move, to give in to the promise laid before me. In the sunlight, all my muscles I kink and release, my breath moving in and out as my lungs capture something besides the stained gray air of indoors. No, there is something resembling hope in every breeze. I breathe in. My body fills with the colors around me in a world that is suddenly so pigmented that I, I can't take it in all at once. May the gray world that grinds and devours us whole be no more. May I listen and breathe and heal. Amen.